Oh, good evening, everyone. Good to see everyone. All your beautiful faces. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross, the finished work of Jesus. So you know that you are already righteous in Jesus. Jesus has made us righteous, and it's not about what you do, but it's about what he did for you. So last time I spoke on a Tuesday, a couple months ago, um, we talked about healing is ready. Some of y'all were here. You may remember that. Um, You know, we talked about how you've already got it. Healing is already yours. And pastor's been teaching on that for months as well. I think we all should know by now that healing belongs to us (laughs) and that Jesus accomplished that for us. You know, when it comes to receiving it, And, you know, whatever else you're believing God for, whether it's finances, um, relationships, restoration in some area, whatever it is, I think some people get overwhelmed by having to believe God for so many things at once. You know, I believe in God for healing in this area, you know, have this pain here and here and believe in God for this healing here. You know, I have all these bills I got to take care of, so I'm believing God for finances um, really, there's so many things, like I, can, I need to have, I have to have faith for this and this and this and this, and it gets kind of overwhelming sometimes. But really, did you know you only have to have faith in one person? That's right. And that's Jesus. And really, you only have to believe one thing. There's only one thing you got to believe. And if you believe this one thing, you're automatically going to believe everything else that you're healed, you're prosperous, you're successful, whatever it is. And really, if you don't believe this one thing, you're not going to believe any of that. And what is that one thing? It's that Jesus has already made you righteous. Yes. Yes. You just got to believe that one thing, and you will automatically believe that you are healed, that you are prosperous. So let's turn over in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We got a lot of scripture to cover tonight, so buckle up. We're going to be moving quick. (laughs) So Matthew chapter 6, we're going to read verse 33. There it is. It says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know, some people teach this verse as this is what I got to do in order to get these things added to me. I got to earn it. This is what I got to do to earn those things. But, you know, you better do this or you won't get this. Some people teach it that way. But that's not true. And that's why it says that second part of that verse. You seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. A lot of people say the first part of that verse, but then leave off the second. They leave off and his righteousness. But we are to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So not your own doings or merits in righteousness, not your own righteousness. It's his righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. They will not be added to you by your own works. You know, Pastor went over this verse a couple weeks ago. I already had it in my notes for tonight, and it was very funny when he read it. (laughs) But he went on, went up, he read it a couple weeks ago on a Sunday. And he kind of explained part of this verse, and I really liked what Pastor said. He said, Seeking first the kingdom is you learning how his kingdom works and operates. So it's you getting in the word of God. That's how you seek first his kingdom. You get in the word. And then that's how you plant that seed. That's the series that pastor's on right now. But seeking his righteousness is learning how you got into that kingdom. That's you're a member of his kingdom because he gave you his righteousness. That's how you got into it. Now you learn how that kingdom operates by reading the word and seeking first his kingdom. 
You know, he died on the cross for you and your sins and then finished the work. That's what seeking his righteousness means, is you meditating on that. All right, so let's go to our next verse. We're going to go to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to read 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But notice that the gospel of Christ is a revelation of the righteousness of Christ, which he has given to us. The gospel is a revelation that Jesus has given you his righteousness. And that is the power to salvation for you and me. That's what this verse says. You know, it's knowing and believing that Jesus has made you righteous. But if he hadn't made you righteousness, if he hadn't made you righteous, then how would it save you? If it was just talking about his righteousness, how would that save you if he didn't give it to you? That doesn't make sense. He'd have to have given it to you for, in order for it to save you. Just knowing Jesus is righteous isn't going to do much for me. But knowing he's righteous and made me righteous, that makes all the difference for me. So in his righteousness is the power to salvation because if you put your faith in him, his righteousness gets added to your account as if you did it. Um, can you pull that, those two verses up in the Passion for me? I really liked what the Passion says. Yeah. It says, I refuse to be ashamed of the sharing the wonderful message of God's liberating power unleashed in us through Christ. For I am thrilled to preach that everyone who believes is saved, the Jew first and then people everywhere. The gospel unveils a continual revelation yeah, of God's true. righteousness, yeah. a perfect righteousness given to us when we believe. And it moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith. Yeah. This is what the scripture means when it says we are right with God through life-giving faith. So when you believe in the gospel of Christ, that by grace through faith, Jesus has made you righteous. You receive this resurrection life, the new birth. And when you grow in, in revelation of his righteousness, that moves, moves you from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith. Meaning that revelation is affecting every area of your life. Now, verse 17 can be translated to say, the righteous by faith will enjoy real life. It's only when you get the revelation of that you're righteous that you even enjoy real life. You're not really living until you have that revelation. So um, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read verse 6 and 7. There it is. It's up on the screen. It says, To the praise and the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. You know, but how can a holy God accept a sinful man? Did his law change? Is he no longer judging people's sins? No, because he already judged them. But he does not judge our sins in our bodies. He judged them in the body of the one, Jesus, who hung on the cross. Now, God is righteous and he is a just God, is he not? He cannot punish that person, that man, that woman, 
for their sins. If he punished us for the same sins he punished Jesus for on the cross, then he would no longer be a holy God. Because he would be punishing the same sin twice. You know, if he punished us for the same sins he punished Jesus for on the cross, then he'd no longer be a holy God at all. So really, if you're saying we have to confess our sins, we have to live by the law, you're saying God is not a holy God because you're trying to get him to punish the same sin twice. People think it's the opposite. They, some people don't understand that. They think they, God is holy, so he has to judge our sins. Well, he did. He already did. But because your sins have been judged on the cross, the devil can no longer have access into your life. Because that's what verse 6 says, that we were made accepted in the beloved. God has already accepted us. And the devil cannot have access into our life because of what Jesus did for us. The only reason Satan ever would is because you don't know who you are in Jesus. And you're believing a lie about yourself in Jesus somewhere. And you're letting him get access. That's the only way he can get access into the life of a believer. You know, you have to, you'd believe a lot, believe a lie somewhere, you know, that you're not good enough. There's still sin in your life. Whatever it is, you're, it's all based on you. Yeah. You're believing a lie somewhere that all your righteousness is based on you. You know, whatever it is, everything you deserved in this life, Jesus took on the cross yes. for us. Yeah. So what Jesus deserved, which is every good thing, that you didn't deserve, you didn't deserve every good thing, but it was given to you yes. through Jesus. And this is why God can be just and righteous in making sinful man righteous. All right, let's go over to Hebrews chapter 5. I told you we're going to be reading a lot of scripture, so we got a lot to cover. We're going to be reading in the Passion Translation, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. It says, For every spiritual infant who lives on milk is not yet pierced by the revelation of righteousness. So this is saying the spiritually immature are those who are inexperienced, don't know or refuse to accept that they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're compared to a baby. Right. You're a baby yeah. if you don't get that revelation. <laughs> but this is how you mature spiritually, right. is to get a revelation that Jesus has made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. You know, this, it says that basically it's saying this revelation is the meat of the word. Right. It's the good stuff. You know, it's not this teaching or that teaching. It's not this. It's not the law. And it's not even spiritual gifts. A lot of people think spiritual gifts are really the meat of the believer's life. But they're not. It's the word of God that is the meat. Specifically, the revelation that you are righteous. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, spiritual gifts are very important. And there's a lot of other teachings that are also important that can help a believers in their walk with God, in their life, whatever. But apart from this revelation, apart from the word, apart from knowing your identity in Christ and your authority in Jesus, it will never bring lasting change. You know, um, getting a word from God or a vision from God or whatever it is, it's not going to help me if I never get in the word. 
As a matter of fact, if someone gives me a word and I don't have a foundation in the word first or have a relationship with God at all, it can harm me more than help me because I will not be able to distinguish whether that word is of the flesh, whether it's my flesh, the person giving me the word, their flesh, or if it's actually a word from God. You have to know God. Yes. Yes. And how do you know him? Amen. By reading his word. Right. Yes. The word is his words, so that's how you get to know him. Yeah. You know, and words and visions can 100% be from God and can be used by God. He did it throughout the whole, whole Bible. He did it. And I've seen him do it today in current time. Like, it can be used. But we cannot be dependent on getting one. We cannot live from word to word or vision to vision. We have to live by the word of God. The word has to come before a word. You know, the word always has to come first. It is the most important thing. All right, let's um, go over to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read in the New King James now. Hebrews chapter 10, we really read 11 and 12 to start with. It says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, who is this man? Jesus. Jesus. But Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. You know, but the priests during the time of law, it says they stood ministering daily. They'd have to stand all day and continuously offer up sacrifices. But why do they have to keep doing it? Well, it answers that actually earlier in chapter 10. So let's go to verse 1. It says, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible, it is not possible, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So the priests had to stand day in and day out because their work was never finished. They, it was constantly, there was constantly someone sinning, so they had to constantly keep acting offering up sacrifices. But the blood of those animals could never permanently cleanse anyone of their sins. But we know we are living under something better today, aren't we? So go back to, let's go down to verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. There was a different sacrifice and a different blood. It was by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil consciousness so no more consciousness of sins. Right. Right. That's right. And our bodies washed with pure water. Yep. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. So it's saying that Jesus fulfilled the law. He offered himself as a perfect sacrifice and then sat down. Why did he sit down? Because the work was finished. 
There was no more work to be done, so he sat down. He kicked his feet back, got comfortable. So I just want to quote a part of the message version. Um, You don't have to pull that up in the back. I'm just going to quote a part of it. It's a couple of verses in Hebrews 10. Um, I love what it says. It says that Christ made a single sacrifice for sins, and that was it. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. So he took our imperfection and gave us his perfection. Now, can you bring those um, up in the Passion as well? Verse 19 through 23. Here it is. It says, And now we are brothers and sisters in God's family because of the blood of Jesus. And he welcomes us to come into the most holy sanctuary in the heavenly realm, boldly and without hesitation. For he has dedicated a new life-giving way for us to approach God. For just as the veil was torn in two, Jesus' body was torn open to give us free and fresh access to him. And since we now have a magnificent high priest to welcome us into God's house, we come closer to God and approach him with an open heart, fully convinced that nothing will keep us at a distance from him. For our hearts have been sprinkled with blood to remove impurity. And we have been freed from an accusing conscience. Now we are clean, unstained, and presentable to God inside and out. So now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. You know, Jesus' blood has washed us clean and even clean, cleansed us from an accusing conscience. Right. Yeah. Like and we can boldly, not timidly, not shaking in fear, we boldly come in and enter the Holy of Holies. So, you know, like, what really is the Holy of Holies? It talks about it quite a bit in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies was the innermost part of the tabernacle. It was the most holy part, hence the name, Holy of Holies. You know, it was where the Ark of the Covenant was in the tabernacle, which was considered God's presence. So God's presence was in the Holy of Holies. You know, but no one could ever enter there except the high priest. And even he could only go in there once a year. And if I remember right, they had to tie a rope with a bell onto the high priest when he entered, just in case he had some unconfessed sin or didn't make a sacrifice, because if he went in there with sin, he would have been struck dead. So they would, if he accidentally died, No one could go in and get them, so they had to have the rope with the bell. And if they didn't hear the bell for a while, they'd start dragging them out. (laughs) Which, it's a funny mental picture. It's kind of ridiculous. But it's also very sad that they had to do that. But it's different for you and I. Because of what Jesus did for us, We can go and walk into the presence of God. We walk with the presence of God wherever we go. The Holy of Holies is now living on the inside of us. His presence is on the inside of us. So, but you know, true holiness, you know, spirit, soul, and body, true holiness can only come when you're on the foundation of the finished work of Jesus Christ that all of your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it mentioned the veil in those verses as well, that it was a representation. The torn veil was a representation of the broken body of Jesus. But 
the actual physical veil was actually in the Holy of Holies as well. You know, it was like a curtain separating everyone else from the presence of God. You couldn't see into it. You couldn't see into the Holy of Holies because the veil was there. It blocked everyone from seeing or entering in. You know, but let's go to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read a little bit about the veil. We're going to start in verse 50. This is Jesus on the cross. And it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, then yielded up his spirit. So that's when he passed. And then verse 51, it says, Then behold the veil, the actual veil, of the temple, or the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. But notice that Jesus gave up his spirit. He passed. He finished the work. You know, I like what um, John's account of Jesus' final moments. I love John's account because he said he records Jesus' final words. Jesus said, it is finished. And then the veil was torn in two. But notice that it was torn from top to bottom, not bottom to top. Meaning it wasn't torn because of the earthquake or anything else. It had to have been torn a different way. It was because Jesus said, it is finished. And then as soon as he said that, God himself tore the veil. Yes. Meaning he got rid of, he tore what was separating man from him in his yeah. presence. Yeah. That thing that was separating us was torn in two right. yeah. when Jesus finished the work. Yeah. You know, Jesus completed the work for us. And Jesus made the finish line our starting point. Yes. Yes. We're starting finished. Yes. Amen. You know, I was uh, a few months, it was about a month ago, I guess, a month and a half, when the Olympics were on. Did anyone watch the, any of the Olympics? Or have at least seen the Olympics at some point? You know, they, after, um, you know, someone wins a medal, they usually do an interview after. You know, asking how they feel, you know, you good? Um, how does it feel to be an Olympic gold medalist? You know, they always interview them. But how stupid would it be if someone was interviewing someone who just won the gold they asked how they were feeling. They said, you know, I'm just really nervous about this game. Yeah. You know, I hope I, I hope I win it. Hope I don't get hurt and just completely lose it and just completely bomb this whole game. Hope I don't do that. Talking about how nervous and scared they are about the games after they already won the gold. How stupid would that be? You know, in this context, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And so, yeah, that's so stupid. But how many people are scared and nervous right. about the doctor's report they just received? Yeah. Yeah. Or that bill that's sitting on their kitchen table? Yeah. Or that how, pe how many people are scared that they'll even enter heaven? Yeah. Yeah. Heard that today from someone. Yeah, I hope I can make it. You know, when I get to heaven, you know, if I get there. They literally said that, and I was like, ridiculous. You know, but why are we acting like that as believers? Why would we say that when we've already won the gold? You know, Jesus has already made us righteous. We are already righteous. And Jesus has already restored us into fellowship with God. That veil was torn. 
you know, restoration is always greater in quantity or greater in quality. But our re restoration with God was greater in quantity and quality. We are restored as sons and daughters. That's a better quality. We're not just creations anymore. We're his kids. That's a greater quality, restoration. It's greater in quantity because he includes healing and provision, our success, our joy, our peace. All of it is included. So it's greater in quantity, too. You know, we don't have to worry about not getting to heaven as a believer. Right. If you haven't received Jesus, yeah, yep. I'd be a little worried. But as believers, we don't have to worry about not getting to heaven. We don't have to worry about that doctor's note or report. We don't have to worry about that bill. It's already been taken care of. You know, we receive all of it by grace through faith and grace is the greatest holiness there is because grace is the only thing that can bring a holy God and sinful man together and it brought us together and what do we do all we got to say is thank you Jesus I believe that you know but how do I receive everything God has for me? How do I receive my inheritance, everything he's already given to me? How do I take hold of my inheritance? Well, number one is by confessing or getting a revelation that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Every time you confess it, every time you read it, you hear it, you get more and more revelation of it, you're taking hold of your inheritance more and more. But number two, Abraham asked in Genesis how he would obtain the blessing as well. And God told him to go get a sacrifice. So for us, it is by looking at Jesus' sacrifice. By remembering it. That's why it's important to take communion. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. It said, you know, we take this bread and we receive the cup. We, pro we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yes. We're remembering it. Right. But Satan knows if you're going by the Lord's death, that inheritance is yours. Yeah. He can't do anything to stop it. Right. But if you're going by your own works, your own efforts, your merits, and you're deserving, then he knows he's got you and you won't take it. When you proclaim the Lord's death, you will confuse the enemy because he doesn't know what to do when you do. You know, but a common question is, can my sin taint my inheritance? If I don't claim it, will it then fade away? Well, let's look at 1 Peter. We're going to answer that. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So you're remembering that sacrifice and him being raised up. Verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, which is reserved in heaven for you. But the word reserved here is the word to watch over. So it's saying that your, your inheritance is watched over in heaven for you. So no one can go up to heaven and take your inheritance, can they? Satan's not doing some stealth mission, sneaking into heaven to go steal your inheritance, is he? Is that happening? No. He's not doing that. You know, it is reserved and watched over in heaven. You enjoy it on earth, but it is protected in heaven. 
but the word incorruptible means not subject to death. Undefiled means it cannot be defiled by sin. And does not fade away means it's not subject to time. So your inheritance cannot be tainted by what you do. Cannot be tainted by your sin. And it does not fade away, so it is never too late to claim your inheritance. So it doesn't matter if you were the worst sinner out there. As soon as you receive Jesus, his blood washes you clean, you can go take your inheritance. And it doesn't matter if you're 90 years old. It's never too late to claim your inheritance. That's right. That's right. So, but long before you enjoy it outwardly, you have to see it inwardly. You have to see yourself healed, prosperous, successful on the inside before you see it on the outside. And how do you do that? By getting in the Word. It's all back to the Word of God. That's right. That's right. And letting it paint the picture on the inside for you. You know, faith is the bridge between the finished work and the spiritual realm. It's the bridge between what is your inheritance, all of that that's in the spiritual realm to come into manifestation in the physical. But sometimes your unbelief can block that bridge. I know some people, I know um, pastors use the pipe illustration before for your spirit, soul, and body. You know, it's you closing that pipe. When you, with unbelief, you close that pipe from what's in your spirit to get into your body. You know, but sometimes unbelief will block that bridge. You know, it says in the gospel that even Jesus could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. They closed off the bridge. They stopped the flow. You know, God will not go against your will. It doesn't take God any time to be ready to give because he's already given. But if you refuse to accept what he has given, he will not force it on you. But the good news is the word is accessible to everyone in here. You don't have to have unbelief. You can get a revelation of this. You can claim your inheritance. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. All right, we're going to start in verse 7. It says, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious. So written and engraved on stones, what would that be? It's the law. If it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For the ministry of condemnation, so it's talking about the law again, it went from the spirit of death, or the ministry of death to the ministry of condemnation. That sounds very good had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we have great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil, separated the glory of God from the people put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 
So the ministry of death written and engraved on stones. Again, that is the law. But again, notice that it calls it this ministry of death and condemnation. Doesn't sound very fun at all. Now, don't get me wrong. The law is not bad. The law is holy, just, and good. But it can never help us get out of our sin. Now, Galatians 3, chapter chapter 3, verse 21 It says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has combined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. You know, so the law was our tutor. It was to get us to a place where we recognize our need for a Savior. To humble ourselves. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. But again, it was to expose our sin and to make us aware of our need for a Savior. That was the purpose of the law. But once Jesus finished the work, there was no longer a need for a tutor. But notice it says that the law entered that the offense might abound, meaning sin increased. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law strengthens sin. But where sin increased, grace increased much more. But I like what the message version of that verse in 1 Corinthians says. It says that it was sin that made death frightening, And law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ. Thank God. So in one single victorious move, Jesus eradicated sin, guilt, and death. But if you could go to Romans chapter 5, if you want to go ahead and put it up in the message, that's fine. I'm going to read verse 17 in the New King James myself. But Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. But if you could bring up verse 18 through 21 in the message, that would be good. Here it is. It says, here it is in a nutshell. So if you haven't understood it by now, here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many people in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, and that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life, a life that goes on and on and on, a world without end. So when it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. Sin has no chance or hold on you anymore. 
you know, but what about all the stuff I've done? What, what about all the sin I've done in my life? Your right standing with God is not based on what you've done. You do not judge your actions from the law, but based on your position as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Is Jesus righteous? Yes. Then so is you. Yes. All right, we're going to have to move pretty quick because I'm running out of time. So go to John chapter 11. You know, I heard a pastor recently explain this story and the significance of every little detail in this story. And it absolutely blew me away, what he said and how he explained it. But he was talking about how the book of John is considered the book of signs. Of the Gospels, it's the book of signs. It has a lot of revelation in it that's pointing to things that happened in the past and that were going to happen. So John chapter 11, we're starting verse 1. It says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Mar Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He is not saying that God put this sickness on him in order to bring glory to himself. That's not what he's saying. He's telling you how it was going to end. Lazarus wasn't going to die. And you're going to see the glory of God. And we're going to explain that a little bit more once we get there. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Doesn't make much sense, does it? He heard the one whom he loved was sick, and then he stayed two more days where he was. Doesn't make much sense. But what's interesting is he stayed two days, and then when did he leave? On the third day. He left on the third day. So can you see what this story is going to point to? But then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? So he's going to a place where they're trying to kill him. All right, skip on down to verse 11 for me. It says, these things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> you idiots, he's dead. <laughs> and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> He didn't hear a thing Jesus just said, did he? <laughs> so when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Martha, Mary was still sitting in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Present tense. She was trying to put him to a future tense, but it's present tense. Yes. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
But she, and she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. When she said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she said the same thing that her sister did. I guess they'd been talking. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled, or he had compassion. And he said, where have you laid him? So he had compassion and immediate action. They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? So they were already questioning his love for him. Oh, yeah, you loved him. But, you know, if you really loved him, you could have saved him. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. You know, but the, there's an interesting word here. This is what the pastor brought out that I was listening to with a story of the Greek word for stone here. You know, the Greek and Hebrew have a lot of different words, and in English we only have one. You know, for love, they have many different words for love, and we only have one word for love. But they also have many different words for stone. But as a matter of fact, in verse 8, when it said that the disciples talked about how they sought to stone him, the word there was just, I think it's pronounced lithazo, not sure, something like that. We're going to go with that. It means to pelt with stones. So that's pretty cut and dry, right? That they sought to stone, they wanted to pelt them with stones. Pretty cut and dry. Or another Greek word for stone is petra, meaning a huge rock. So you think petra would be used here because it's a stone over a tomb. You think that's what the word they would use, meaning a huge rock. It's not. They actually used the word lithos, lithos, however you say it. And the Holy Spirit is very intentional with how things are written and what words are used. You know, we read a verse earlier tonight with the word lithos in it. 2 Corinthians 3, 7, the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones. Talking about the law. You know, it goes on to say in that same chapter that the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory than the ministry of death, which had some glory. But notice it says, Jesus said, take away the stone, take away that law. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by now there is a stench where he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So you cannot see the glory of God as long as the stone is not rolled away. That's right. That's right. As long as it's still in your way, you're not going to see it. Nope. You know, but isn't what Martha said here a lot like a lot of religious people today? You know, she said, um, we, can't, we shouldn't remove the stone because of the stench because he stinks. Lazarus stinks. He's been dead four days. We shouldn't remove that stone. But modern way of saying that was, you know, you can't teach that grace stuff. We have to keep teaching the law right. because if we don't, we're giving people a license to sin. Yeah. Yeah. 
people are going to stink. You stink. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, people didn't need a license to sin. People have been sinning for thousands of years. Right. They've never needed a license to sin. Yeah. Yeah. They automatically just do it. You know, if people are using grace as a license to sin, they don't have a revelation of grace. They haven't been taught it. That's right. That's right. You know, there is going to be a stench. You are going to stink if you roll away the stone or the law from an unbeliever. They're still dead in their sins. They're still going to stink. But for the believer, we have been raised to life. We have a new life. We are new creations. We do not stink. That's right. That's right. You are to roll the way, roll away the stone from the believer's life. You know, if you remove the stone from an unbeliever's life, sin will come forth. But if you roll away the stone from a believer's life, the glory of God will come forth. But the stone hinders revelation in the believer's life. Okay, let's go to the next verse. It says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, they may believe that you sent me. Now when he said those words, When he said those things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out, bound hand and foot with gray clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, said to them, Loose him and let him go. You know, but what's interesting is that he was bound hand and foot, so how did he come forth? God was bringing him out. He, he was probably floating. Could you imagine that? This dude wrapped in all this cloth, just floating on out. <laughs> it's a very funny mental picture. You know, but what if Martha had refused to let them roll away the stone? Right. Lazarus would have been alive in the tomb because Jesus has already asked. Lazarus came to life as soon as Jesus asked. He would have had no way out. <laughs> He would have been stuck in there. When a believer tries to stay under the law, they're alive as new creations, but they're staying in the tomb. They're alive, but they're not living. So this story was all pointing to what was going to happen when Jesus died and rose again. That's what it meant in verse 4 again when he said that the sickness wasn't from God, or the the sickness was not unto death, but for the glory of God. It's talking about his own death. I'm going to die, yes, but I'm going to be raised to life, just as Lazarus, and the glory of God's going to come forth. Because rolling away the stone would reveal the glory of God. You know, in Mark, uh, John 20, verse 1, it talk, it's when um, they came to the tomb of Jesus and they saw that the stone was rolled away. You know what that word stone there is? It's lethos. Right. The law had been rolled away. You know, but when the stone's rolled away, what happens? That means you've been raised to life. Yes. And you're raised to life with him, and then you see the glory of God. Yes. And you get rid of those grave clothes, is what they told him. But Jesus told them with Lazarus, get rid of those grave clothes. Yes. What are the grave clothes? That's what was remaining identifying him with death and that old life. 
you know, but how do you and I get rid of our grave clothes? So renewing your mind to the word of God. Once again, it's back to the word. You know, 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If you still have your grave clothes on, you're still operating under the letter, the law, and not the spirit. Um, really quickly, I know it's getting late, but just real quick, just want to mention a few other interesting places that the word lethos is mentioned. It's used in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. This is when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness. The devil was tempting Jesus, and he told him to, stir, to turn that stone into bread. Meaning he's saying, see that law? There it is. Command that these stones become bread. It's lethos again. Command that law to bring nourishment and life to you. Right. Can't happen. Yeah. It's the ministry of death. Mm -hmm. It cannot bring life to you. But read verse 4 real quick. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What the devil was trying to do was get him to go back to the law and forget what God had just spoken over him. What had God just spoken over him? He had just gotten baptized, and this Satan left off the most important word that God said to him. He said, if you are the Son of God, but God told him, you are the beloved right. Son of God. That's right. yes. He was trying to get Jesus to forget what God had said over him. But the devil has no defense against someone who knows their love by God. And real quick again, Lethos is used in John chapter 8. This is the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. Um, let's go back to verse 5 really quick. Let's read that. Y'all know this story. Or I've heard it before, I'm sure. This is the Pharisees saying, Now Moses and the law commanded us that shut should be stoned, but what do you say? Stoned here is the same stone used before that means to pelt with stones. So they're talking about literally killing her. Verse 7, though. It says, So when they continued asking Jesus, he, said, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is out sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He used a different word for stone. He used lethos here. So what he's saying is, He who is among you without sin, let him throw the law at her first. None of them could. They all left condemned. The law brought condemnation. They left condemned. But you know, Jesus was the only one there that was without sin. He could have thrown the law at her. But he didn't. He took away her condemnation and then ministered life to her. Literal life. He saved her life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then one more time that lethos is used. It's in Mark chapter 13. Verse 1, it says, Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall, be not, that shall not be thrown down. So once again, the law is holy, just, and good. And it is not bad. And even Jesus said that the buildings were great. The law is great. But once Jesus finished the work, not one stone would be left standing. Not one law would be left unfulfilled. Right. And that wall of separation between you and God will be thrown down. Yeah. Wow. That's good. That's good. All right, one more verse really quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are almost done. 
Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Okay. And verse 17, really quick. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, behold all things have become new. When Jesus died, we died with him. Yeah. So what is this saying? And when Jesus rose, we rose with him. As completely new and perfect creations. Right. You know, we exchange identities. Yes. Um, verse 21. For he who made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Right. So we exchanged identities he took our identification as sinful man and gave us his identification as righteousness right. as a righteous child too right. you know Ephesians 2 verse 6 says we were raised with him and made and seated together we died with him and then we rose with him and the resurrection is proof that your sins are forgiven. Yes. Right. Yeah. If there was even one ounce of sin that remained in Jesus, he could not have been risen from the dead. Right. That's right. That's right. So the resurrection is proof that your sins are forgiven. Yeah. You know, there's nothing compared to getting a revelation of this. That's right. This really sums up the whole gospel right here. You know, it's a redemption story between God and his creation turned kids. Yeah. You know, I'm glad for one to be on the redemption side of it. Amen. <laughs> you know, but really what's interesting is people keep wanting and praying for revival. Hear that a lot? Lord, send us revival. We need it. It's already happening. For those of us that have a revelation of this, it's been going on. That's right. You know, it never stopped. You know, some people, well, Lindsay, you know, I was around when we had those revivals back in the day. Nothing like that is happening now. Where'd you go? Why'd you leave? Come on. It's still happening. Why'd you leave it? You know, there's been a revival going on since the day Jesus rose from the dead when he revived us. If you're missing it, that's on you. It's going on right now. But if you think a revival is only going on when, you know, people are running around, chairs are breaking and all this stuff, you've got a wrong idea of revival. That stuff is good and has its place, but not above the word. You know, well, I don't believe that. Revival isn't happening anymore because of all the sin that's going on in the world. You know, if you really believe that, you don't believe that Jesus is greater than sin. And you don't believe he rose from the dead either. You know, if revival could stop because of sin, it never would have started in the first place. You know, revival is a state we live in, in Jesus as new creations. Yes. Yes. You know, and you will believe that when you believe and get a revelation that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. You know, but like Pastor's been talking about on Sundays, we have to plant the seed to see the harvest. That's it's right. been one of my favorite series he's ever done. Excellent series. Everyone needs to go back and listen to it. If you haven't heard it, go listen to it. If you have heard it, go listen to it again. Amen. But the word is the most important seed there is. That's what he's been talking about. Well, I think you just got some pretty good seed from the word, did you not? Amen. So make sure to water it this week and keep thinking about this. Keep feeding on it.